13. The last two studies that we've had as, as part of the conference, the last two studies we've had as part of the conference have been related to some issues surrounding the history of the Bible. My dad yesterday afternoon talked, kind of did a summary of, of from Wycliffe to King James. And then Bud last night was talking about the historical reliability of the Bible. What we want to do in this hour today is talk about the cultural and the linguistic impact of the King James Bible on English-speaking people. And, and on the, the history and the culture of, of all people that speak English. And to get it started, I want, I want you to listen to this. This is the introduction from a book called In the Beginning by Alistair McGrath. And, and he says this. He says, the two greatest influences on the shaping of the English language are the works of William Shakespeare and the English translation of the Bible that appeared in 1611. The King James Bible, named for the King of England, who ordered the production, a fresh translation in 1604, is both a religious and a literary classic. Literary scholars have heaped praise upon it. 19th century writers and literary critics acclaim it as the noblest Monument of English prose. In a series of lectures at Cambridge University during the First World War, Sir Arthur uh, Coo declared the King James Bible was the very greatest literary achievement in the English language. The only possible challenger for this title came from the complete works of William Shakespeare. His audience had no quarrel with this judgment. It, is accept it was accepted as a standard wisdom of the age. The King James Bible was a landmark in the history of the English language and an inspiration to poets, dramatists, artists, politicians. The influence of this work has been incalculable. For many years, it was the only English translation of the Bible. Many families could often afford only one book, a Bible, and in whose pages parents recorded the births of their children and found solace at their deaths. Countless youngsters learned to read by mouthing the words they found in the only book their family possessed, the King James Bible. Many learned Bible, many learned by biblical passages by heart and found that their that found that their written and spoken English was shaped by the language and imagery of the Bible. Now listen, without the King James Bible, there would have been no no Paradise Lost, no Pilgrim's Progress, no Handel's Messiah. No Negro spirituals and no Gettysburg Address. These are these and innumerable other works were inspired by the language of this Bible. Without this Bible, the culture of the English-speaking world would have been immeasurably impoverished. The King James Bible played no small part in the shaping of English literary nationalism by asserting the supremacy of the English language as a means of conveying religious truth. The King James Bible, folks, is the pinnacle. It is the summit of written English prose. Not only is it the Word of God, and not only should you honor it and value it as the Word of God, but as a piece of literature, it, there is no greater piece of literature in English than the King James Bible. The influence that this Bible has had over the last 400 years has affected politics, it's affected art, it's affected literature, it's affected every facet of the, of the culture of the English-speaking world because of the influence. The King James Bible became a part of the everyday world of a generation of English-speaking people spread across the world. It can be argued that until the end of the First World War, the King James Bible was seen not simply as the most important English translation of the Bible, but as one of the finest literary works in the English language. It, it did not follow literary trends, it set them. The, the book that is before you for the last 400 years, and especially for the first 300 years of its existence, became the standard by which English was judged, based on the, the, the literary forms, the prose that you find in the King James Bible. Interesting statistic, until very recently, the King James Bible was the world's best-selling book in English. Sometime in the 1980s, it was supplanted by the New International Version, which remains tops today. But still, listen to this, there are more than 1 billion English speakers in the world today. There are about 1 billion people in the world today that can speak English fluently, and there are in existence at least two King James Bibles for every one of those people that can speak English. Okay? This is by far and away the best-selling book of all time in the English language is the King James Bible. 
And it has only been in the last 25, 30 years that other versions have topped it in terms of the number of things, that number of uh, copies that have been sold. Now, much like my father did yesterday, I do want to quickly say some things about the history of the English language. I want to give you a brief history here, okay? There are three distinct time periods in the development of English. One of them is Old English. That dates from about the 6th century to the Norman Conquest in 1066, which he made reference to yesterday. Middle English from about 1100 to 1500, and then Modern English from about 1500 to the present. The story of the King James Bible cannot be told without understanding how the English language developed. The English language, like all languages, has been evolving for centuries and will continue to do so throughout the, first, throughout the 21st century. How many of you are aware that even modern versions, every 10 to 15 to 20 years, put out updating of the language that they, that they have. There are modern NIVs that are, are, have been up, uh, updated even further from when it was first published in the late 1970s. Compared with language development of many civilizations, however, English developed relatively rapidly. For instance, while the development of Greek and other ancient languages spanned several thousand years, the time it took for the Anglo-Saxon language to, to arrive, or the, the forerunner, I should say, of modern English to develop, uh, only is going to emerge within about a, two, a few hundred year time span. Now, when the Romans, how many of you are aware that there was a time in history when the Romans occupied the greater majority of, of Britain? Okay? They, they, they built a wall, they built Hadrian's Wall to separate Roman-occupied lands in the south from, from lands on the other side that were not occupied by the Romans. But when the Romans arrived there, a few years before the birth of Christ, when the first Roman legions land on, on, on Britain, English as a language does not exist at all. There is no such thing as an English language when the Romans arrived a few years before the birth of Christ. The language of that time and place included both Germanic and Celtic elements in it. And it was not until the 6th century that a small percentage of, of people began to speak a prototype of what we would identify as being English. Okay? Now during this, old, during this old English time period, from the 6th century until the Norman Conquest, you can see the dates on the slide there, Britain was tossed about, by, in, and, and the language was in flux by a series of invasions. Okay? People from the mainland, people from other areas in Europe are going to invade England. People, the, the, the Germanic tribes, the Saxons, the Jutes, all of these different groups are going to battle for the supremacy and control over, over, the language, over England. Okay? And eventually, folks, the Romans are going to pull out. And when the Romans pull out, it's going to create a, this power vacuum in Britain, and all these other groups with an interest in controlling the island are going to flock to it, and there's going to be a very unstable time period. But when you, when you look at that time period in relationship to the language, all of these people are, are spilling into Britain, and they all have their own language, and so they are all contributing different words, different phrases, and so forth, and you begin, and this, this sort of, this, this mixing bowl, if you will, of language is starting to churn, all right? Then you add to that the fact that in the 6th century, Pope Gregory is going to send a Catholic missionary named Augustine to England. Now, what are the Catholics going to bring with them? What language? The Catholics bring Latin. Okay? So now you have Latin, and you add to it all the, the languages of these different invaders that have, been, that have been invading the island, and you have this, this big mix of language. And the politics of invasion and conquest, what they did is they took the language captive uh, along with the people. And the early invaders today, known as the developed language, known as Old English or Anglo-Saxon, and this formed the rudimentary base for the language that we now speak today in the modern period, okay? So the Anglo-Saxon conquest was success, was so successful that very few words have survived from the original British language. So the, the language of, of Britain had, it was like there was an all-out onslaught on it by the Catholics and their Latin and all these different groups that were coming, and all of this language then gets mixed up, and it, it, what's going to emerge is Anglo-Saxon or Old English. 
You add to that also the Vikings. The Viking invaders are going to come from the Nordic lands there, Scandinavia, and they're going to come in and seek to uh, assert some dominance in, in through raiding and other things in, from about 750 to 1050. Then they're going to bring with them monosyllabic words, and they're going to bring elements of the old Norse language now across from Scandinavia, and that is also then going to have an input and an influence in the old English time period. The English language went through a period of severe neglect during the Middle Ages, okay? And my dad made reference to this yesterday. The conquest of England by the Normans, the French Normans, in 1066 at the Battle of Hastings, led to the suppression of English in public life. And what emerges, folks, because of these French people that are now dominating the government, English becomes sort of the, the passé language, and it's viewed as the language of the uneducated masses, where the, the language of politics, the language of diplomacy, the language that is, is being spoken amongst the intelligentsia, if you will, of England at the time, is going to be French. So when that happens, the English language during the Middle English period is actually going to be suppressed and viewed as inadequate for expressing the finer details of philosophy, law, theology, and those, those disciplines. And if English is going to be suppressed, and in, in, in French is going to be predominant while the French are occupying and running the government. So the widespread perception is, emerges that French had established itself as the language of the cultural elite within Europe. Now, by the way, this is not just in England and France. There was this, a perception that that was the case in other areas as well. And English then is going to be dismissed as a crude language, incapable of, of, of conveying the subtle undertones necessary for diplomacy, philosophy, and certainly not discussion of theology, and certainly not producing a Bible in what? In English. Okay? So these factors are going to lead to the suppression of English during the Middle English time period and actually suppress the idea that English is even capable of expressing the Word of God because it's viewed as an inferior language. Now, it is during this Middle English time period that John Wycliffe began the process of translating the Bible into the vernacular English of his day. Wycliffe is going to say, I don't care about that. We need to have a Bible in our own language. So Wycliffe is going to begin the process of translating the Bible into Middle English. Okay? Now, the academia of England, not just the theological people that are running the church, the Catholic church at the time, but also there are other regular people in, in the academic circles of England that, that do not believe that what Wycliffe is doing is going to do the Bible justice because they are operating on this perception that English is, inferior, is an inferior language, period, and the Bible should not be in that language because it's incapable of expressing uh, the subtleties of the, of, of, of the mind of God and so forth. In 1401, a debate over the use of English in church life ensued at Oxford University, and in 1407, Thomas Andrew, Bishop of, Archbishop of Canterbury, issued the following statement. He said, we therefore legislate and ordain that nobody shall from this day forth translate any text of the Holy Scripture on his own authority into English or any other language, whether in the form of a book, pamphlet, or tract, and that any such book, pamphlet, or tract, whether composed recently or in the time of John Wycliffe or in the future, shall be read in part or in whole, in public or in private. Okay? Now that is, no doubt, an expression of the church's desire to suppress the Word of God in the language of the people. But it also is, expresses the idea and the attitude that the people of the day had toward English itself as being an inferior language to French and incapable of expressing the words of God. English thus became, through Wycliffe and the Lollards, which were mentioned to you yesterday, the language of the religious underground. Okay? The Wycliffe Bible is going to be copied, it's going to be distributed, it's going to be disseminated, and there are people of the, of the common rank who eat it up and love it. 
but it's going to be frowned upon not only by the Catholic Church, but also by other people within England at the time. Now eventually, the Hundred Years' War is going to break out. And this, the Hundred Years' War was fought between England and France. And it's during the Hundred Years' War that the people of England come to the very real perception that, wait a minute, why are we speaking French? French is the language of our law, our enemy. Okay? So once the Hundred Years' War breaks out, there's going to there's gonna emerge a perception within England that we've got to get rid of this French because we don't want to be speaking the language of our law, of our enemies. Okay? So that now there's going to be a movement. The war with France, when that came to an end, English is going to begin to become the language of choice of the upper class and the governmental departments. Okay? No longer was English dismissed as the language of the lower classes, and it was now the language of choice of a nation with an increasing sense of national, national identity, shared purpose, strengthened by England's growing maritime enterprise. England is an island, correct? What is more important to the English, a strong army or a strong navy? So the maritime enterprises of the British are going to bring them into contact with eventually, with literally every part of the globe. Okay? And as England is beginning to become, beginning to emerge now as a, as a legitimate power uh, during this time period after the Hundred Years' War, they're, they're, they begin, they're going to slowly begin to emerge. Language is going to become more and more acceptable. Now, for our story of the King James Bible... It cannot be told without an understanding of the remarkable rise in the confidence in the English language in the late 16th century. What was once scorned as a barbarous, barbarous language of the plowman became the language of patriots and poets. A language fit for heroes on the one hand and for the riches of the Bible on the other. Gone were any hesitations about the merits of the English language. Elizabeth's Navy, Queen Elizabeth's Navy and Armies, had established England's military credentials. The defeat of the Spanish Armada, which was mentioned to you yesterday, under, under uh, Sir Francis Drake and Queen Elizabeth there, there England is going to emerge as a legitimate power, uh, power structure in England, uh, I'm sorry, in Europe, and eventually the world, okay? How many of you have ever heard the phrase before that the sun never sets on the British Empire? The British are going to establish eventually a worldwide empire, okay? And what, t what touches that off, the building of that empire, is the defeat of the Armada under Queen Elizabeth, all right? Now, with that, the English people, all of a sudden, they, they have confidence militarily, but it also lends them confidence in the emerging language. The poets, playwrights, and translators had propelled English as a language to the front rank of European languages. And the King James Bible consolidated the enormous advantages in the English language over the centuries and can be seen as a symbol of a nation and a language that believed that their moment in history had arrived. Okay? There are, there are trends in history that are emerging here that if you're going to understand why the King James Bible is the pinnacle of, of spoken English and written English, you have to understand what is, what is leading up to it. it is, in 1589, the art of English prose was written of the Elizabethan age. George Putman declared that English was just as sophisticated as Greek or Latin and perfectly capable of expressing the full range of human emotions and thoughts. Now, was there a time, though, when that was not the case? Okay? To write in English, to translate in English, <clears throat> was a political act affirming the intrinsic dignity of the language and of a newly confident people and nation. So you have to understand, folks, that when we get to when we get to 1603 and 1604, when Elizabeth dies and King James is going to be crowned King of England, many many things have happened, not just to the to the English people themselves, but in the development of the language. The decision to translate, 
In silence in her bedchamber, the question, Elizabeth is dying, okay, and she's laying on her bed, and they come up to her and they say, look it, we can't wait anymore. You've got to name who your successor is going to be. All right? And Elizabeth says, the son of Mary, Queen of Scots, James the Sixth. James, previous to the death of Elizabeth, has already been king of Scotland for many years. Okay? And on her deathbed, Elizabeth names James the, James the Sixth of Scotland as her successor, and she is reported to have said, Who but our cousin of Scotland should sit on my throne? Now she kept James in the dark about this all the way up until the time when she was breathing her last breaths. Okay? Now, so on March, March 22nd, 1603, the Privy Council drafted a statement naming the successor to the throne of England, and the next morning, Elizabeth, the most powerful monarch in England's long historic history, and, and the remaining heir to the line of Tudor, started under Henry VII, Henry VIII's father, is going to die. And James I, James VI of Scotland, is then going to become King James I of England during that time period. And he is going to establish now the House of Stuart as the, the, the rightful line to rule over. And so King James is proclaimed King James I of England, France, Scotland, and Ireland in 1603. And he, so James then is going to leave Scotland and he's going to begin to travel to the south to take up his throne now in London. All right? And as James does that, he encounters a party of Puritans, members of the Church of England who are angry and not happy with the state of the Church of England. Now, my dad talked to you yesterday afternoon about the fact that in the Church of England, really what it was was the Catholic Church with a different name and a different head. Instead of the Pope being head of it, the king or the monarch was head of it, but everything else in it was essentially the same as what they would have had under the, under the reign of uh, the Popes and Catholicism. Now these Puritans are, have long been irritated by this. They want to see more reforms made. They don't like these things. And Elizabeth drafted a statement when she was queen in 1559 that had retained both the bishops and the distinctive robes of the clergy. Okay? The Puritans viewed these things as vestiges of popery, that vestiges of the Catholic Church, and they didn't like these things. So on her death, they already have a document drafted, it's called the Millenary Petition, and they intercept James on his way down from Scotland to, to, uh, to his coronation in London. And they present him with this document, the Millenary Petition, signed allegedly by a thousand uh, Puritan members of the Church of England, uh, protesting various aspects. All right, Some of the things, for example, that are contained in the Millenary Petition are the use of crosses in baptism. Um, the use of rings in the wedding ceremony, the rite of confirmation, terms like priest, bishop, and absolution they object to. So anything that the Puritans view as leftovers from Catholicism, they, they stated, now look, they've been, they've been sitting on this for about almost 60 years. About 40 years, about 40, about 40 years. They haven't liked what Elizabeth has been doing and, and they haven't had, Elizabeth refused to hear these folks while she was alive, okay? Just absolutely refused to hear what they had to say. And what Elizabeth had done, folks, is she had established what she called the middle way. As the head of the church, uh, as the head of the church that was Roman Catholic in appearance and, pro, and Protestant in doctrine and belief, she was determined to end what she considered madness. James saw no reason in changing anything. We studied this last Sunday in our class, that Elizabeth tried to walk a line, and what she did is she created a church that would, that, that would, not, make the, that would not make most Protestants all that upset, nor would it make any, most Catholics all that upset, and so she tried to walk a line right down the middle for political reasons. Well, James, when he is now going to be king, he, is, he sees no reason to change 
what Elizabeth has done. On October 24, 1603, James issued a proclamation stating that he had convened a conference to be attended by himself and the Privy Council, as well as bishops and other learned men, to deal with the issues raised by the Protestants at Hampton Court the following in January of the following year. And this is where you're going to have the impetus for the King James Bible. Now, the Puritans are ecstatic. Because the king has agreed to what? To hear their, their grievances. So they walk into this meeting thinking what? He's going to give us what we want, right? Well, on day one, James hears the bishops of the Anglican Church first. And he rips them. Up one side and down the other. Okay? He just trashes them. And the, and the, the, the Puritans are thinking, oh boy, this, this looks good for us. Well, the second day, the Puritans are allowed in there, and he rips them even worse. Okay? So James is ripping both the established Church of England and the Puritans. Everything that the Puritans brought up to, to James, James said refused to go along with what the Puritans were suggesting. And it's interesting that the idea of a, of a, of a new translation is mentioned by a guy named, I'll get his name right here, John Reynolds. John Reynolds is one of the main presenters for the Puritan case at the Hampton Court Conference, and he goes through the entire litany of all of their objections. And then he gets to the end, and the king has refused every single thing that, that, that they've said, and they say, well, what about a new translation? Now that... James, that, that piques James's interest. But it's almost, honestly folks, it's almost as offhand a suggestion, it's almost an afterthought. That was not the main thing that these men wanted going into that meeting. But it's the last thing that they, they state. Implicit in the Puritans' request was a criticism of the official Elizabethan Bible known as the Bishop's Bible. After the Bishop's Bible, after the bishops who had translated it in 1568. Now, understand, do the Puritans like the Church of England? No, but they want to reform it. So any Bible translation that has been translated by bishops of that church, are the Puritans going to be for or against it? They're going to be against it, Okay. So, in the fact that the Puritans are against it, they, they favor, as my dad said yesterday, they favor the Geneva Bible. The Geneva Bible had been translated by Protestant exiles from England in Geneva, Switzerland, during the reign of Bloody Mary. Okay? And the Geneva Bible contained tons of marginal notes. In fact, you could rightly call the Geneva Bible the first study Bible ever made. Okay? But James hates the Geneva Bible. And as it was pointed out to you yesterday, the reason James hates the Geneva Bible is because the Geneva Bible has notes, marginal notes in it, that James views as seditious against the king and against the crown because they attack, those marginal notes attack the issue of the divine right of kings. But on the other side, James does not like the Bishop's Bible either because he says it is a wooden and obtuse Translation that is not very good. I want to read to you just a couple things from Adam Nicholson's book, God's Secretaries. He says, Reynolds, by making his suggestion for a new translation, was without a doubt asking for a revision of the Bishop's Bible, probably in favor of the Geneva Bible, which he himself would have used. That is the meaning of his phrase, only one translation. Which also makes a subtle appeal to James' dream of unity. But James says, James says, James says here, professing that he could never yet see a Bible well translated in English. But worst of all, His Majesty thought the Geneva Bible to be, with, with all, he gave this caveat upon the word cast out by my Lord of London, that no marginal note should be added, having found in them, them which are annexed to the Geneva translation, some notes very partial, untrue, seditious, and, and savoring too much of dangerous, traitorous conceits. 
So that's James' view of the Geneva. He doesn't like the bishops. He doesn't like the Geneva. And in an attempt now, he knows that he has to do something. Because in day one, he excoriates the church officials. Yeah. Now in day two, he's excoriating the Puritans. And now the suggestion, though, for a new translation is going to give James an opportunity to continue to walk that middle road. Because what he's going to do now is he's going to take Puritans and church officials and he's going to put them together and say, Here, you guys work together and give us a new what? A new translation. And so the king is going to, you know, I don't want to bore you with the details, but they draft rules, 15 rules that the translators are going to follow. And, and they are divided up into six companies. And each one of the six companies, there's, there's, two at, there's two at Westminster, there's two at Oxford, and there's two at Cambridge. And each one of these companies is going to be uh, responsible for translating a different portion of the Bible into English. There are rules that they are given to, to, to govern the process of the translation. And then the companies, once they have a section done, they send it to all the other companies who review it. And so once every company has approved it, then at the end they're going to have a big meeting where they're going to approve the final text. Now, I want to talk to you about the age of Shakespeare and the translators. The demise of the Roman Catholic Church in England outlawed, as it was from the days of Henry VIII, confiscated all the properties abbeys, castles, lands, and so forth that the church owned, the Catholic Church, and left a gaping hole in the culture of England. Listen, if there's one thing that you could say about the Catholic Church, did the Mass provide pageantry, pomp, and circumstance for the, for the people of England? And now it's what? It's gone. So that creates a vacuum. And in 1576, James Burbage built the first theater in London. There had not been a theater in town for more than a thousand years since the Roman occupation. What was lost to the people when the pageantry of the Catholic Church and the Mass went away was returned to them by the rise of the theater. Alright? The pulpit was exchanged for a stage. And the language of plays was reminiscent of the high tone of the Mass. It was, after all, a listening culture, a culture of word, a peculiarly, a peculiarly English occupation. Think for a minute with me about the English Renaissance. What is the English Renaissance known for? It's not known for art. It's not known for music. It's not known for sculpting. It's not known for architecture. The English Renaissance is known for its literary writing. It is known for Shakespeare. It is known for those playwrights who are going to dominate the English stage during this time period of history after Henry VIII. And so the culture of England now, under the uh, with a new confidence in the English language, is going to become a, a culture of language. And in the play is going to be the stage upon which this is going to act itself out. English captures its reflection in words and the subtleties of human voice. And it should be little wonder, folks, that English has become the has become the language of the civilized world. English even today dominates still music, film, literature. And the dramatic arts. The English imagination was and remains aureal or auditory. It expressed itself in sound and the culture was tuned for it. Shakespeare and others would have not written as they did had the audience not been able to understand what they were doing. Touching Englishness at its heart, to the quick, the play became the very soul of the English Renaissance. And it is the key to understanding the age in England. To ignore the development of the theater is to ignore the spirit of the age. The powerful linguistic tie that swept everyone up, that saturated the culture. And listen to this. In the years between 1584 and 1623, hardly more than a single generation 
More than 50 million people pass through the theater doors in England. Okay? The King James translators, every one of them, is raised and reared in that culture. That culture that values the spoken word. So when these men then are going to be entrusted with the process of translating, they're going to take what they learned from the culture that they were reared in, and they're going to apply it to the translation that they're going to make. Now, the King James translators were steeped in this Elizabethan aesthetic, this powerful linguistic vitality, the Hamletized soul, if you will, of the age that was characterized by a penetrating high-velocity wit and melancholy that spun forth the finest lines ever written in English. Okay? The translators were all Elizabethans. They were all passionately literate, and this aesthetic could only enhance the beauty and the magnificence of what was already found in Scripture as they sought to take that stuff out of Hebrew and Greek and put it into what? English. It had the ability to make the beautiful more beautiful. The Elizabethan aesthetic, folks, was the filter through which the King James translators tested every word, every phrase, every syllable. And it was a literary spirit that governed the culture, a spirit of word, and it was a profoundly English endeavor that, would, that, that had risen to its zenith under the Elizabethan reign in England. The plays of William Shakespeare were never written to be read privately or studied. He did not. Do you know that Shakespeare did not even publish his own plays in his own lifetime? They are published after Shakespeare is dead. Because Shakespeare does not... You know, you went to your English class in high school, and you sat there with the book, and you assigned cards, and everybody was like, uh, yeah, la, 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 and then the next person would read, uh, la, la. No, 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 no. That's not what Shakespeare intended. Shakespeare intended for his play to come alive and in front of the audience. He never intended for them to be just read. And the King, the King James Bible, you need to think about this. When the, when the order was given to translate the King James Bible, it was translated, and the order was that it was to be read in the churches. It was to be read what? Audibly. And so when they go to translate it, their, their goal, their endeavor, is to translate a Bible that would sound rich when it was read audibly. You ever read a modern version? You ever heard a modern version read and you're just like, geez, that doesn't even sound like a Bible. John Bios, or Boyce, I'm sorry, records in his notes, he's one of the translators, that the final stage in the entire process of the production of the King James Bible, that the final stage was an audible read. What they did is they met in a room and somebody stood up and they opened up what they thought the translation should be and they read it audibly. And if anybody sitting in the, in the sound of the reading objected to something, they would, they would raise their hand and they would object, and then they would fix it or work it out based on what they read. Now, hang on one second here. I, I think I got this. Yeah. Now, look at this. Andrew Downs suggested, this is the, this is the original read of Hebrews 13a. The original suggestion was Jesus Christ yesterday and today the same and forever. Now that's what they read audibly in this final review. Somebody raised their hand, John Boyce records it in his notes and says, yeah, that doesn't sound right. And so after working on it, the final version reads, Jesus Christ, the same yesterday and today and what? Does that sound better? So what did they do? They took it and after hearing it audibly, they wordsmithed it. Okay? Oh, I got, I got some other examples here I want you to listen to. Okay? This is Hebrews 11.1. 1. The original suggestion at the final audible read read like this. Faith 
is a most sure warrant of things. Is a being of things hoped for, a discovery, a demonstration of things that are not seen. Now this is what they this is how it reads now. This is what they decided on after this process. Now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. Woo. That sounds good, doesn't it? First Corinthians 13, 11. The, the, they said the original suggestion was, I understood, I cared as a child, I had a child's mind. But then after they went through this process, they decided that when I was a child, I spake as a child, I understood as a child, I thought as a child. But when he became a man, I put away what? Childish things. What sounds better? See, they're, they're testing every word, folks, through the, through the filter of the culture and the time in which they're reared with the goal of producing something that is majestic. That's why that Bible is the pinnacle of English literature. Because of the process in which these men are using here. Another one would be 1 Thessalonians 5.23. Their original suggestion was that, he, that your spirit may be kept perfect. They decided on your whole spirit and soul and body be preserved blameless. In other words, Philippians 1.21, they, their, their suggestion was, life unto me is Christ and death an advantage. And they decided that for me to live is Christ and what? To die is what? Woo, what better? Just one more here. Tyndale, who they use quite a bit in the translation... Matthew 11, 28, Tyndale's translation read, Come unto me, all ye that labor and are laden, and I will ease you. The King James, after the King James translators, after going through this process, they, they came to this translation, and you guys will know it, right? They said, Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you love. Rest. You see what these guys are doing here? They're, they're taking, they're seizing the opportunity as English is at its pinnacle under this Elizabethan age. And these men are reared in the culture of that age. And it falls to them to make this new translation. And the final step, the final stage in the process is where they stand up and they read it and they translate it in a manner that it'll sound like the Bible. So that when it is read audibly, and when the audience hears it, it will ring in the ear and in the heart as if it were God's Word. You follow that? One of the major factors that led it. You know, some people will say what? Well, the Bible, the King James Bible, has all those these, thou's, and wherefore's, and why for's, and all that stuff. Do you know that those, that people weren't even speaking like that at the time they made the translation? That stuff was already falling out of common use, but the reason they did it is so that they could give you the most accurate translation that they could give you. Leland Rankin, commenting, go, go to 1 Corinthians 13 with me. First Corinthians 13. One of the things that, that critics of the King James Bible will say is that it's too hard to read and this and that. Yeah, I did a study in, in May at the conference in May on uh, talking about the readability of the King James Bible, how all that's a myth. There are fewer words, fewer syllables, fewer uh, uh, fewer lot, fewer words in a line in a King James Bible than there is in a modern version, and it's been proven by linguistic experts that the King James Bible has a lower reading level than an NIV. Grade level, reading level. First Corinthians chapter 13, look with me at verse 4. Notice. Now, look at Charity suffereth. Well, uh, that's archaic. That extended verb ending suffereth. Nobody talks like that. Just read it. Charity suffereth long in his time. Charity envieth not. Charity vaunteth not itself. Is not puffed up. Doth not behave itself unseemly. Seeketh not her own. Is not easily provoked. Thinketh no evil. Rejoiceth not in iniquity, but rejoiceth in the truth. Does that flow off the tongue? That flows off the tongue. That, that's smooth like butter. Okay? And so when the passage flows in a weave-like cadence out of the rise and the fall of the sound of the words. 
And the passages also show how the accentuated verb and the ETH keeps the rhythm flowing as you read it. To rob the Bible of these extended verb endings, you lose the rhyme. You lose the meter. You lose the rhythm. And the passage just bumps along in a staccato fashion. And you lose the richness of it when it's read audibly. Another factor to consider is the King James translators try to reproduce the Hebrew and the Greek text as literally as possible in English. Therefore, many of the features modern readers find strange are not Renaissance or Elizabethan traits, but Hebrew and Greek traits. These men were trying to make a literal translation. And so some of the places where you read it, you say, oh, what? The reason it might be sort of hard to read in English has nothing to do with the English. It has to do with the Greek or the Hebrew. And what these men are doing is they're trying to lift out of the donor language, Greek and Hebrew, and deposit into the receptor language, language English, exactly the meaning and exactly the word order that is maintained in the original language. And so look at the slide here. Genesis chapter 1 verse 24, the, the King James Bible says, beast of the earth. We would say what? Land animal. But the expression beast of the earth, this common formula in the Bible of the noun, of a noun plus the word of plus the noun, the standard English way of achieving the same effect, to turn the sound, the, the second noun, into a modifying objective in the place of the first noun. Now when they do this, they're not doing it to be cute. They're doing it because that's what it says in Hebrew or Greek. But doesn't it sound better? Psalm 22, Psalm 2, 9, rod of iron. Isaiah 5, 22, men of strength. John 4, 7, women of, woman of Samaria. Let's keep going here as we work our way to the end here. A subcategory of the noun plus of plus noun construction occurs when the same noun appears on both halves of the formula. Now think about it. King of what? Now when you do that, are you expressing in heightened, elevated terms the fact that he is the king of what? King. He is the Lord of Lords. Song of Solomon. Song of Songs. Ecclesiastes 1-2, vanity of vanities. This is the, the, these are the most heightened forms or expressions that can be expressed in our language. And the King James translators are taking them out of the donor language, Greek and Hebrew, and they're depositing them into English. And by having these forms and literary devices, they not only are they maintaining the original word order of the Greek and the Hebrew manuscripts, but they are also expressing in the most heightened way possible in English the sense of what the passage means. Even when the noun of noun formula does not meet the, spe the special conditions based on the preceding paragraphs, it is simply a common formula in the King James Bible. For example, angel of the Lord. Another one, the river of God. The bread, you know, the other verse in Proverbs 4.17, that they eat the bread of wickedness. James 3.18, the fruit of righteousness. Ecclesiastes 10.18, idleness of hands. Once altered, the noun of noun, once altered the noun of noun construction, we find it nearly continuously in the King James Bible. In addition to preserving the word order of the original, the King James Bible gains rhythmic smoothness from this construction. And remember, it's being done that way because these guys are translating it in a manner for how it will what? Sound. When it's read. Another, another formula that this that is mentioned to the King James Bible are the lo and behold statements. The grammatical term for this is an interjection. The function of the formula is to signal the spectacular nature of the event or the profound importance of the statement. Okay? 
The effect is all explained. Revelation 30, Revelation 3.20, okay? Behold, I stand at the door and what? Knock. Acts 7, Acts 12.7. Behold, the angel of the Lord, what? Matthew 8, Matthew 28, 20. Lo, I am with you all. See, those are, when you hear that, it's, it's, it's designed to draw your what? Attention. It's like saying, listen up. This is important. Better listen. Literary forms and features continue. Did your English teacher ever tell you never to start a sentence with the word and? Go to me to Judges chapter 3. Come to Judges chapter 3. <coughs> Judges chapter 3. Look with me starting at verse, look at verse 21. Judges chapter 3, verse 21. So it had the ancient, look at the ancient Hebrews and Greeks, they didn't, wouldn't have listened to your English teacher because they started sentences and things all the time with the word and. Okay? In Hebrew and Greek, the prefix wa has a way of has has this meaning, and in Greek the, the word is ka. The effect is of these, uh, of these frequent use in, in the King James Bible is to create a tremendous sense of continuity. Everything flows in sequence. The construction often shows a sense of cause and effect as one thing produces the next. Look at Judges 3, verse 21. And she said, according to your, uh, according to your words, so be it. And she, she sent them away, and they departed, and she, bound the, and she bound the scarlet line in the window, and they went and came unto the mountain, and abode there three days, until the pursuers were returned, and the pursuers sought them throughout all the way, but found them one. See how many times it says and in those two verses? Did I tell you to go to the wrong spot? I'm in the wrong spot. <laughs> Let me get that right. I apologize. That was in Joshua. <laughs> Judges 3. I'm going to set my bed. Judges 3, verse 21. And Ehud put forth his left hand and took the dagger from his right thigh and thrust it into his belly. And the half also went in after the blade. And the fat closed upon the blade. So that he could not draw the dagger out of his belly, and the dirt and the dirt came off. Now you see how many times it said "and" in that. The other one just happened to work real well too. By the way. <laughs> okay. What's that doing? The reason there's so many "ands" in there is because all those "ands" are in the Hebrew text, and so the King James Bibles are the King James translators are trying to lift that out for you and put it in your own language. So that you can understand the intricacies of what the verses are saying. And he did this. And then he did that. And then he did this. And it flows and it builds the idea for you so that you can follow what's happening. A, well, this is a list. One of the most fundamental factors to the willingness to accept and use verbal Equivalency in translation, that is a word for word translation, is that many, uh, many phrases having their origins in Hebrew, in Hebrew um, Greek, or Latin context have been naturalized in English through the simple yet inexorable force of the use of their use in the biblical context. Biblical English came to possess a cultural authority on the same level as Shakespeare. And as a result of centuries of use, many Hebraic Hebrew phrases and idioms have become so common in normal English use that most modern English speakers don't even know that the phrases they're using are of biblical origin. Okay? So what that's saying is that what they did here is they literally, they, they lifted the idiom, the figure of speech, out of Hebrew and they brought it over here and they deposited it in English. And then once the King James Bible became popularly used, these phrases became common figures of speech and idioms in English. And people use them all the time and they don't even know that the origin of the idiom or the figure of speech goes all the way back to the Hebrew manuscript. And here's some examples here. 
Okay? You ever hear somebody say, to lick the dust? To fall flat on his face? A man after his own heart? To pour out one's heart? The land of the living? Under the sun? You ever heard somebody say that? You're just, that's just sour grapes? That comes from the Bible. And not only does it come from the Bible, it comes from the Hebrew Bible. And it was lifted out of the Hebrew Bible and put in English for you so that you could have it. And then people read the King James Bible and that became part of the everyday common spoken language. From time to time, pride goes before a fall by the skin of his teeth. To stand in awe, to put words in his mouth. How many of you ever heard these things? How many of you use these things? These things are not just coming from the King James Bible. They have their origin in the Hebrew text. And the King James translators brought them out of Hebrew for you and deposited them in English. A comparison of the King James Bible. A comparison of the King James Bible with the Geneva Bible suggests that the King's translators were much more likely to retain the Hebrew word order or structure when it resulted in a reading that did not sound quite right in English to English ears at the time. The passage of time and increased exposure to the translation has eliminated any awareness of its initial strangeness and led these phrases to be accepted as normal and common standard English. Another reason, folks, why the King James Bible reads as it does is because of the specific instructions that were given to the translators. Every company of translators was given a 1602 edition of the Bishop's Bible as the base text. And then from there they set about to make the translation. According to David Thames, or Thames, that's the author of this book right here, Majesty. Despite being a difficult text, the Bishop's Bible, the information contained in the Bishop's Bible comprises only 8% of the King James Bible. So they changed 92% of it, the translators did. That's how, that's how junky the Bishop's Bible was. As a translation, according to their ears, listening to it. In contrast, estimates vary, some as low as 76%, and some as high as 94%. But the general consensus among historians, biblical scholars, and biographers is that William Tyndale, the first guy, you should remember this from yesterday, the first guy to translate the Greek text into English, his translation is responsible for 90% of your King James Bible. 90% of your King James Bible is identical, just about, to what Tyndale did in 1525. And look at what we got from Tyndale. These are idioms. Tyndale, Tyndale's responsible. He, see, Tyndale is, is a pioneer, folks. Not just in the translation of the Bible, but in language altogether. Tyndale is responsible for introducing the following idioms or single words into the English language. He came up with fight the good fight. My brother's keeper, the apple of his eye, the spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. All of these are coming from Tyndale. Sign of the times, in the cool of the day, ye of little faith, a law unto themselves, peacemaker, long-suffering. And then, if there wasn't a word in English, Tyndale invented one. Just invented the word. And put it in the Bible. And now we talk about these things as if they're common. The words that he invented are Passover. Didn't exist before Tyndale in English. Scapegoat. Jehovah, atonement, landlady, seashore, fisherman, stumbling block, taskmaster, two-edged, viper, zealous, and beautiful. The word beautiful did not exist until 1525 when William Tyndale translates the Bible and puts that word into English. And then the King James translators took Tyndale, and this is 90% what Tyndale did, and so Tyndale's contributions have made it into this Bible, and then when this Bible became the Bible of the, the Bible that was widely read and accepted by English-speaking people, the words of Tyndale became common everyday English idioms and figures of speech. Look, folks, people use this stuff all the time and they have no idea that they're even doing that. Get 
to that in one second. I'm almost done. In the prologue to this book right here, 2010 book, Begat, the King James Bible in the English language, David Crystal tries to assess the true impact of the King James Bible on the English language. The surest way to analyze the effect of the King James Bible on the language according to Crystal is to look at how many expressions have become so thoroughly assimilated into the language that any sense of their biblical origin is lost. And after analyzing all the figures of speech, all the idioms, they, the, the author of this book concluded, after a systematic study of the King James Bible, that this Bible, that there are 257 idioms in modern usage that were popularized by the King James Bible. No other work in English literature can make such a claim. Not even Shakespeare. The effect of this Bible upon our language is greater than the effect of William Shakespeare. Okay? Now, some concluding thoughts, and we'll be done in five minutes. The King James Bible, folks, was published within a window of opportunity which allowed it to exercise a substantial and decisive influence over the shaping of the English language. It is not an accident that the two literary sources most widely identified as the defining influences over English, the King James Bible and the works of William Shakespeare, date from the same time period. Do you know that William Shakespeare's career as a playwright was at its height and at its zenith during the years the King James Bible was being translated? He writes his best plays between 1604 and 1611. There was virtually universal agreement in the 19th and early 20th centuries that the King James Bible had made a massive contribution to the development of the English language in general, and the English prose in particular. Yet there is no evidence that the translators of the King James Bible had any great interest in the matter of, of literature or linguistic development. Their concern was primarily to provide an accurate translation of the Bible. On the assumption that accuracy itself was the most aesthetic of qualities to be desired. Paradoxically, the King's translation achieved literary distinction precisely because it was not trying to accomplish it purposefully. Aiming at truth, they achieved what later generations recognized as beauty and elegance. Elegance was achieved by accident rather than by law, design. The King James Bible is both simple and majestic. Adam Nicholson, this guy right here, the author of God's Secretaries, says, and you need to listen to this, one of the King James Bible's most consistent driving forces is the idea of majesty. Its method and its voice are regal. Its archaic formations, its consistent attention to a grand and heavily musical rhythm are the vehicles by which the majesty is infused into the body of the text. Its qualities are those of grace, stateliness, scale, and power. There is no desire to please here, only a belief in the enormous and overwhelming divine authority. I'm telling you, you translators of modern Bibles engage in a self-defeating venture when they produce Bibles that do not yield the effects common to the readers of the King James Bible and its heirs. A Bible translation that, listen to this, a Bible translation that sounds like the newspaper is given the same level of attention as the newspaper. Someone has correctly said that modern collo colloquial translations slip smoothly into the ear. But they also slide out more easily. The very strangeness and antique ceremony of the old forms make them linger in the mind. When you read this Bible, it sounds like the Bible. 
It, so, it sounds like God speaking to you in your language. How would God speak? Would God say, hey man, what's up? How you doing? Is that the way God, if God were saying, is that the way he would talk? If you got a Bible, it sounds like the newspaper's going to go right out the other side just as easily as the news. I read the newspaper this morning, I don't even remember what I read. You know that? Leland Rankin, again, authored the legacy of the King James Bible Chronicles, the following results of the ascendancy of modern versions. He says that number one, a common English Bible in both the church and the culture has been lost. Was it an easier time when everybody that, that taught, when everybody said, go get your Bible and read from the Word of God, that it was just assumed that everybody was going to get a King James Bible? Amen. Was that an easier time? That was a much easier time. Now you go to now you go to some places and you can't even read the Bible aloud because everybody has a different one. Number two, the authority of the Bible went into eclipse when we lost a common Bible. When, when our culture lost a common understanding of what the Bible was in our language, the authority of the Bible did an immediate one. Third, biblical literacy. That is an understanding of the Bible in general. Has accompanied a decline in biblical literacy has accompanied the decline of the King James Bible. Our people in our culture, with all the modern versions that are supposedly easier to understand, better to read, are they more biblically astute and educated now than they were 75 years ago? No. But I thought all this stuff was supposed to help us. In conclusion, I want to read to you from this book. I know I'm over time. Sorry. First, here it is. Claims, you need to listen to this. Claims by modern translators and Bible scholars that, Christian, that the Christian public is fortunate to have been delivered from the archaicness and occasional uniquenesses of the King James turn out to be hallowed. If Bible knowledge in our day has declined across the board, where is the alleged gain from modern versions? The very proliferation of translations has discouraged the Christian public from seeking to know what the Bible actually says. The ideal, of course, has been for a single successor to the King James to be its replacement, but it did not happen. This sentiment is widely held that because today we find the King James Bible archaic and difficult, it must have been equally archaic and difficult for readers in previous eras. This is a great fallacy. Readers of the King James Version throughout the centuries did not struggle with this language, just as modern readers have never relinquished the King, uh, never uh, relinquished the King James, managed just fine with it. Are we better off today without the King James Version than Christendom was for centuries with it? No. Those eras had many advantages over us. Although we cannot turn back the clock, we should lament what has been lost and not claim an illusionary superiority. What has been lost? A common English Bible. A nearly universal reverence for the Bible as an authoritative book. And biblical literacy. The facts are in, folks. This is the pinnacle of written English. The British established a worldwide empire and sent this book to every corner of the planet. And everywhere this book went, and it was believed, and it was taught, and it was preached, it revolutionized the culture. Because the power of God is in the Word of God. And when the culture has accepted the new idea that they're all the same, that it doesn't matter, and we've lost a common understanding of what the Bible is, 
The result has been disastrous to the church, the body of Christ. And it's about time the so-called scholars begin to realize what their scholarship is doing to the church. It's not making it better. It's making it worse. Dear Father, we thank you once again for Jesus Christ. We thank you for the saints that have come out and listened to this presentation and throughout the entire weekend. And we pray that we'll just um, be edified for having come out. We ask these things in Christ's name. Amen. All right. We're supposed to be starting the next session now. We'll take a 15-minute break and start.